Praise the Lord. We are back in church again. Thank the Lord for his grace that has brought us to this place, Apostolic Church in Whitesboro, Texas. Brother Kelly Gray, it is a blessing to be the servant of the Lord and to be able to share his word and to enjoy his presence together with the church as we lift up the name of Jesus. And we're going to do that in song. Worship with us. Amen. And just let the Lord come into your heart and touch you. Bless you in a precious way. Hallelujah. Lord, you're worthy of my highest praise. Lord, you're worthy now and for always. Your goodness and mercy it causes me to say, Lord, you're worthy of
said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And so that's our desire tonight, Lord, is to lift you up, that your will be done. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord for his word. Excited to get into his word tonight. I love the word of the Lord. I love going into the word of the Lord and seeing how it unfolds and how God has woven his truth into the word of God and how we can glean so many wonderful messages and so many wonderful things from the word of God and gain a better understanding of this world that we live in, the life that we are living and the life that we can live. And one day we will, by his grace, live in glory. We talked about heaven just the other last service and it was awesome getting into the word and uh, just knowing where we're going and knowing that there's so much more ahead of us and uh, we don't have to worry about the past if it's put under the blood and so thank God for his presence and his grace and all that he is doing and the church is supposed to be and I say supposed to be powered by the anointing of the Lord it's not powered by personalities it's not powered by orators, great speakers. It's not powered by money. It's not powered by influential people. It is not powered by nations or creeds. It is powered by the anointing of the Lord. Amen. Now, there are churches that are being influenced by these other things, but God's church, somebody say God's church, God's church. is powered by anointing. It is God's spirit. It is his presence. It is his anointing, amen, that we should be seeking. It is his anointing that will heal. It is his anointing that will deliver people from demonic oppression and possession. It is his anointing that will give us the victory over anything that we will ever face or ever could possibly face in the world that we live in. I want to turn to the book of Zechariah, chapter 4, and verse 6. And I want to allow you to remain seated tonight. We like to stand in honor of the word of the Lord, but we'll give you a little bit of a break tonight. Zechariah 4, and verse 6, is a very beautiful scripture. The Lord speaking through Zechariah. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Zerubbabel, the king, was needing direction. And God was giving direction and letting him know it's not going to be by horses or chariots or by wealth or influence, but it's going to be by my anointing, my spirit, amen. 
And church, it's not by might and it's not by power. Amen. It's by the anointing of the Lord that we will go forward, that we will conquer and do the will of God. We will overcome and that we will find the victory in the journey that we are on. And I am thankful tonight that I know in whom I have put my trust. Can somebody say amen? Amen. 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 I want to go back to the book of 1 Kings and uh, share a little bit with you of Elisha and the first time that he experiences, or I assume this is the first time he experiences the anointing of the Lord. It may not be. It doesn't seem to indicate in the scripture Elijah has been up on Mount Carmel and has defeated the prophets of Baal. And then uh, Queen Jezebel put a bounty on, on his head and he fled for his life and went out into the wilderness hoping to die. And there God lets him know that uh, he's, got, he's not the only one serving him, that he's got 7,000 that haven't bowed their knee to Baal and that everything's under control and I uh, said, I've got a few things I need you to do. And he sends him out of the wilderness. And one of his jobs is to anoint Elisha to take the ministry of the priesthood or the, of the prophet. And, uh, and so in uh, 1 Kings 19 and verse 14, this is where we have come to. Elijah has just come off of the mountain out of the wilderness, and uh, chapter 2, I'm sorry, where am I at here? I'm in the wrong book. That'll help if I get in the right book. We're going to go to 2 Kings. I'm in 1 Kings 19. There we go. And verse 14. 1 Kings 19 and verse 14. This is where Elijah has just come down out of the wilderness. And beginning at verse 14, the Lord, he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God hosts. I'm going to go ahead and read that. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I... Even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Methala, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. We'll stop there for just a moment. The Lord is letting him know you're not the only one serving me, and that is a problem that Many of us serving the Lord will come across somewhere in our journey is where we feel all alone and like we're the only ones living for God or holding on to the truth. But God has a large host that are serving him faithfully day and night. And so you're not alone. It does not mean that you do not feel alone, but you are not alone. And then God proceeds to tell Elijah some of his things to do, to anoint a couple of kings, and then he is to anoint, uh, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, thou shalt anoint to be the prophet in thy room. Now in verse 19, he goes on, so he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who is plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12th, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And the Bible says he left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him, took a yoke of oxen, slew them, boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen, and gave unto the people, and they did eat. And then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. I don't know what he felt when Elijah's mantle 
settled on his shoulders, but it was a life-changing moment for him because at that moment, everything that he ever knew and everything he was building towards vanished, no longer had any value. His only ambition from that moment on was to be with the man of God and to do whatever God wanted. Amen. The anointing changes us. The anointing, I believe, changed Elisha at that moment. From plowing with oxen, and this is my job, and this is what I'm going to grow up and do what my father's done, and this is where we're... And the next moment, he's having a big feast and celebration and waving goodbye to everything he's ever known to follow the anointing. Amen. Now, it's a very interesting journey because remember... Elijah is headed off to anoint a couple of kings, and then we don't know at this point in the scriptures what's going to happen, but God obviously has let him know, you take care of this business, and I'll take care of you. So this next one, we move up to 2 Kings chapter 2, and we will begin at verse 8. Now... Elisha has been following Elijah, <coughs> and uh, everywhere Elijah goes, and Elijah has even tried to shake him off and tell him, why don't you stay in this here town, and I'm going to go on up to the next town, and Elisha says, nah, not going to happen. I'm going with you wherever you're at. I'm going to be with you, and so finally when we get to verse 14 of chapter I'm sorry, verse 8 of chapter 2. I'm going to get these things straight sooner or later or keep you thoroughly confused. Chapter 2, verse 8. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and he smote the waters. They were about to cross a, a river and they were divided hither and thither so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee after I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. They've been around some prophets, and those prophets have told Elisha that the Lord's going to take your master from you today. Don't you know this? And, uh, and he is aware of this, and so that's why he stayed so close to Elijah. And now Elijah has given him an opportunity to ask a blessing for God to fulfill. And Elisha asks for a double portion to be twice the man of God that Elijah was, all right? Verse 10, Elijah says, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, horses of fire, parted them both asunder. Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, and Elisha saw it. And he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took a hold of his own clothes, and he rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, went back and stood by the bank of Jordan, and he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the God of Elijah? And when he had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And verse 15 says, And when the sons of the prophets which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. We're talking about the anointing of the Lord. The anointing of the Lord is powerful. The anointing of the Lord is sure. And if we're going to do anything in the kingdom of God, we need the anointing. What did I do? What is a mantle? Mantle was his robe that he wore. I don't know if it was like a cloak uh, there are so many different versions out through time. I haven't, I haven't studied that, but his mantle was a, like a cloak that he wore, he carried with him, yeah. to my knowledge. Amen. 
And so that's what he passed on. And so that mantle was simply used as a reference point. The mantle was not anointed. God chose to work through that in the anointing. Just as when we lay hands on the sick and pray for them, the hands are not the anointing. The oil's not the anointing. They're just a vessel or a tool or a, 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 a representation of our faith that God works through. And that's what he did with the mantle. And so when Elisha took the mantle and smote the waters, said, where is the God of Elijah? The waters parted. The anointing is what did that. And sometimes people get their eyes on the mantle or they get the eyes on the preacher. And they think, ooh, if I can just say things the way the preacher says them, or if I can just, we just have to do what God wants. And the anointing will work through anybody. All right? These are examples of the word of God for us, but God's anointing can and will work through anyone. And so this is, this is a good example of someone coming in contact with the anointing for the first time and then experiencing the power that manifests through the anointing that is on their life. And this is the will of God. This is something that God was wanting to, when you fast forward the word of God to our time, this was what he wanted for all believers, not just the prophet, all right? And prophets have their own anointing, but God wants that anointing to rest on all of his people and for the anointing to work through us for his glory. In Jeremiah, we're going to run into some false prophets, Nobody likes false prophets. Jeremiah 27 and verse, well, actually, actually, we're going to just kind of skip through here. I'm going to pick some verses out. I'm not going to read the whole thing. You'd be welcome to uh, read this if you get a chance when you go home. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 27 and 28. Uh, this is just before Nebuchadnezzar's victory overtaking Jerusalem. To get an understanding of the time period, and some of these scriptures we'll read will help that, but what is going on at this time, God is sending Israel into exile. He is allowing Nebuchadnezzar to conquer them and take them back to Babylon. They obviously don't want to go, but Jeremiah is in tune with God, and God knows, and, and Jeremiah knows what the Lord is doing. And Jeremiah has tried to tell the people that if you will submit to Nebuchadnezzar when he comes, then you can remain here. But if you rebel and fight back, you're going to lose everything and get packed off to Babylon. That's what Jeremiah tells them. All right. But the people don't want to hear that. They want God to deliver them. And so their prophets come up with prophecies that are the opposite of this. And their prophecies say that, oh, that God is going to give them victory and that they're not going to have to do this. And so I want you to get a glimpse of prophets that operate without the anointing. There are prophets that are false prophets. And that's what the Bible tells us. You need to know them that labor among you that what they teach and preach and live is truth. Because there are many that are out there for gain and not for godliness. Chapter 27 begins, verse 1, In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came the word unto Jeremiah, this word, from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord to me, Make thee bonds and yokes, and put them upon thy neck. So Jeremiah goes out and he carves him a yoke, like you would hook up to oxen, or to mules and used to pull uh, wagons and plows and what have you to harness together to them. And Jeremiah makes him a wooden yoke and he puts it on his neck and he begins to walk around through Jerusalem. And this is part of his ministry to let the children of Israel know that they are going to go into bondage. And that Nebuchadnezzar is going to put a yoke about them and they're going to be his servants and they're going to do what he tells them to do. And of course, they don't like this. Uh, verse 14 says, Therefore hearken not unto the words of the prophets that speak to you, saying, You shall not serve the king of Babylon. 
for they prophesy a lie unto you, for I have not sent them, saith the Lord, yet they prophesy a lie in my name, that I might drive you out, and that you might perish, ye and the prophets that prophesy unto you. Israel is backslid. And they are doing what they want to do, and this is why God is judging them. And through Jeremiah the prophet, he is literally telling them what's happening. You have backslid. I am judging you. Your prophets are lying to you, and this is going to fulfill this punishment that I have planned for you. <laughs> it's almost like God coming to you and telling you that if you keep going down that road, you're going to follow into a ravine and you're going to lose everything. And you're like, oh, right, I don't believe that. And just ignore what God says and then go fall into the ravine and lose everything you've got. God is telling them ahead of time. This is a prophet. A prophet is the word of God comes from a prophet. It's proven by God. Because what he says when it comes to pass, you know, yep, that was a prophet. But if it doesn't, and we'll read this because he shares it with Israel and talks to them about this. And so then he winds up getting into somewhat of a showdown with the prophets, the false prophets. All right. Um, nevertheless, let's go to chapter 28 and uh, we will go to verse, let's move up to verse 7. The false prophets have said many things. Verse 7, Nevertheless, hear thou now this word that I speak in thine ears and in the ears of all the people. The prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war, of evil and of pestilence. The prophet which prophesied of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord truly sent him. Now he goes into Hananiah is, is one of the false prophets that's been prophesying against Jeremiah and reversing what Jeremiah says. He says that, the, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar is not going to bother them and that he's going to turn around and he's going to leave them alone. Verse 10, then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke. Remember the yoke that Jeremiah made and was wearing around his neck? Hananiah took the from the prophet, the yoke off of the prophet of Jeremiah's neck, and he broke it. And Hananiah spake in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. And I am quite sure that when Jeremiah went his way, he's like, Oh, man, is he in trouble. All right? He didn't get very far. Verse 12. Then the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet, after that Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. And I have given him the beasts of the field also. Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah, the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth, this year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. We're talking about the anointing of God. There are those that are going to play with the things of God. I don't understand the word yoke. Yoke. When you have two oxen that need to pull a plow... They have a yoke that goes across their necks. They've got a couple of loops, okay. and it sits over their necks, and then they hook the plow up to that. Okay, They're yoked together. Okay. What this yoke meant symbolically was that Israel was going to be yoked up with Babylon. Okay. 
They were no longer going to be Israel, their little nation off doing their thing. They no longer exist. They are now in, in yoke with Babylon. And this is why the people of Israel didn't want to believe this. And this is why this lying prophet was able to get the people to buy in because that's what they wanted to hear. But they refused to listen to the man of God that was anointed, that the Spirit of God was on, and that was leading them if they would allow him to. But the problem was is they wouldn't let him lead them. All right? They would rather choose their own way. And we need... God to direct us. We need the anointing of the Lord to direct us. And if we walk in truth, he will direct us. The challenge with this is that they were walking in lies and deception. And so therefore they were lied to and deceived and didn't even know it. Even though the man of God that was validated and did have the anointing of God upon his life was telling them what was going on. They refused to accept it. And as you read out in studying Old Testament on this, when Nebuchadnezzar conquers Israel and hauls them off into bondage, there is a captain of Nebuchadnezzar's army that takes Jeremiah aside and says, what do you want to do, prophet? Because Nebuchadnezzar knew he found out what was going on in Israel, that Jeremiah had told the people what was going to happen and that it all came to pass. And so this king, this captain, told Jeremiah, he says, what do you want to do? He says, do you want to stay here with your people? Uh, I'll give you money and, and make sure you're taken care of. Or do you want to go back to Babylon with your people? And I'll make sure that you have a good place there and that you're taken care of. God takes care of his people and his prophets. And no matter what the false prophets say, no matter what the devil says, child of God, you don't have to worry about what happens. That's why we don't need to get our eyes on this world and all the trouble that's in this world right now. We know judgment is coming. We don't have to worry about that. We're the children of God. The anointing of the Holy Ghost is on us. And God is going to direct us if we walk in truth. God will honor us. God will protect us. God will preserve us through all of this. And the beauty of all this is that God's glory will be manifested in the end. And so the prophet that told the truth, which was Jeremiah, everything he spoke came to pass. And God did take care of Jeremiah. Jeremiah carried such a burden for the children of Israel. He loved his people so greatly, and he suffered so much trying to minister to them and to help them to see this. And it's so sad sometimes the burden that a godly leader can have for people, and they just don't recognize it. They do not realize that that is their greatest friend and asset in life, a man of God that's hooked up with the Lord to help them and lead them, and they refuse to submit to his teaching and his guidance. And this is where Israel is at at this point. And as we see, God does not take lightly when people play with the word of God, with prophecy, with people's lives. And that's why it's important that you as a saint of God, you need to make sure that you're plugged into truth so that you're being led in the way that God wants you to go so you can be what God wants you to be. Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 27 tells us that the yoke is destroyed by the anointing. Isaiah 10 and verse 27. And as it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder, his yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of what? The anointing. In the New Testament, the gospel that is preached, repentance, turning from our sinful ways and turning to the Lord, baptism in his name and our sins being remitted and covered by the blood through the name that is pronounced over us in water baptism, and then being gloriously filled with the infilling of the Holy Ghost or the anointing of God's Spirit upon us. Because of that anointing, it breaks the yoke that the devil has had on us. 
And when we submit ourselves to the Lord and His will, that anointing stops the enemy from destroying us. And what he means for evil, God winds up turning for good. I had a young man at work this week that was having some struggles, and he's not probably where he needs to be in the Lord. And uh, he made a statement to me one day as he was having a problem with something, and he says, you ever have one of those days when you got this black cloud and it just follows you around? <laughs> and we laugh about it. But when we're not under the anointing of God, that black cloud follows a lot of people. Amen. Because Satan delights in discouraging and destroying people. And he knows if he can get someone discouraged, they will curse God. They will turn against the only one who can help them. And this is the way that the enemy works. This is what Murphy's Law leans towards. Anything that can go wrong will. Why? Because that's that dark cloud that follows us. But when we're a child of God and we've given our life to the Lord... We don't have that dark cloud. Amen. We're not governed by that. Satan has no control over us. It does not mean he won't impact our lives or do things because go to the book of Job. Job's doing the will of God, and it's God that brings Job to Satan's attention. And Satan afflicts Job... And the only way he can afflict Job is because God gives him the power and the authority to do it. Okay? Hear me out. God's doing something. Child of God, if God lets the devil torment or cause problems in our life, it's never to destroy us. It will strengthen us. Not only that, it will be a blessing to us. Remember Romans 8 and 28 says, For we know that all things work together to the good of those who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. So if God allows Satan to reign into our world, that little dark cloud shows up, it's not a threat. It's a blessing. Amen. Because God knows what you're going to go through. He knows you may skin a knee. You may skin an elbow. It may be a little painful but that you're going to heal and he's going to bless you in abundance for whatever you have to deal with in that struggle or that trial. The anointing breaks the yokes. We are no longer servants to the devil. We are no longer under his control and authority because God's spirit breaks that yoke. Now, we have to be careful as the children of God that we don't yoke ourselves back up with the world again. How do we do that? We drift away from the Word of God. We drift away from our prayer time. We drift away from our spiritual activities, the things that we do to stay close to God. And we start partaking of the world's activities. We go out into the worldly music, worldly media. We go out into the worldly habits whether it's drinking or partying or whatever, and we wind up going back into bondage or being yoked together again with sin. That's not the will of God, and we don't have to do that. We need to be careful because Satan will try to lull saints into that. If you've been living for God for a long time, you can become relaxed and say, oh, yeah, that's not all that important. I'm not going to worry about it. And, and say, you know, I kind of like when you start to dab the next thing you know, you may not be too, you'll be farther away from God than you are from the devil. And that's when we become yoked up again with sin. And it is possible, but it's not the will of God. Amen. The yoke is broken by the anointing of God's spirit. We are set free from that. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, Jesus encourages us. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. We'll read through verse 19. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, 
and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. The anointing was on Jesus Christ so that he could minister to us. And the anointing is on us so that we can minister to others and each other for that matter. Because now the same spirit that was on Elisha doth rest upon us also. Amen. The anointing of the Holy Ghost or the Spirit of God. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, it talks about these signs shall follow them that believe. Mark 16 and verse 15. Jesus speaking as just before he ascends. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall, not be, shall be damned. Verse 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. How is that possible? It's because of the anointing of the Lord. The anointing of the Holy Ghost. God's Spirit on us. I can't heal anyone. You can't heal anyone, but God can heal everyone. And so God has chosen to give authority to the church, power over sickness, power over disease, power over demons. In the name of Jesus Christ, we can pray for people, and God answers those prayers. Amen. They can be healed, not because of who we are, but because of who He is, but because His anointing rests on us and it's his desire to work through us in that fashion and it is incredible luke shares the same uh, story but gives us a little bit different take on it luke 24 and verse 46 this is just before the ascent just before he ascends up into heaven Luke 24 and verse 46, And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. What is that power that he's talking about? It is the power of the Holy Ghost. This is one of the reasons why I believe that new believers need to have some good teaching and they need to understand a little bit, I believe, of at all possible about the Holy Ghost and God's presence in their lives because I have seen people come into a church service, be moved on, by the ministering of the word and the Holy Ghost come to an altar and pray through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost and walk out and not even realize what has happened and go right back into the world and continue back on living the way they were and not even realize they have just entered the portals of glory and then turned around and walked out back into the world again and left it behind and not instead enjoyed what has been made available to them. There are so many, I'm afraid, that have come through Pentecostal churches that have experienced God's glory, and because they did not know the power that was available, did not know the glory of the moment and what all had happened in their lives, they could turn around and walk right back out into the world and forget it and not even realize what had happened. Jesus said here that they would be endued with power from on high. Now, this is going back to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Peter is sharing the words that Jesus shared with them before he ascended on high. In Acts 1 and 8, he says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Why would God want his anointing upon us? So that we could be witnesses. 
so that we could share this gospel with the world around us, so that we could lay hands on the sick and they would be they would recover. What does that do? That is a witness that the God of glory is granting his favor to flow through us. Healings, deliverances, and miracles. Because God knows the proof of the prophet is in the answered prophecy. If the prophet says something is going to transpire and it comes to pass, then you know that that prophet is of God. If it doesn't come to pass, you know that he's not of God. Well, if God anoints us to pray for somebody and God heals them, they're going to know that God is in us and they can trust us. That is the beauty of the gospel and the church that the Lord established in the book of Acts. And on the day of Pentecost, when they were gathered together as he commanded them and the Holy Ghost is poured out for the first time, they begin speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance and immediately... The witness light came on. People came to see what was going on. People heard them speaking in their own languages and knew that they were Jews, Galileans. How could they be speaking in their languages? And then Peter began to witness to them and let them know this is the promise that God said in Joel that I'm going to pour out my spirit upon my servants, my handmaids, and that God was going to do a great work in the last days. Church, we are that work. We have that anointing. And if we don't have it, if you don't have the anointing power of the Holy Ghost, you need it. We live in a culture today that is full of false prophets. Some of them are false prophets intentionally. Some, I think, are false prophets because they are ignorant to the truth that God has yet to reveal to them. But regardless, there are many people that are misled by their false prophesying. And the teaching that they share, there are many that are taught today that if you just believe that Jesus died on Calvary, that you're filled with the Spirit. You've got the anointing. You've got the Holy Ghost. And that is not born record to the Word of God. When you go into the book of Acts, when they received the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2, they spoke in other tongues initially. And then guess what happened? There was an anointing that came on them that allowed them to pray for the sick and lay hands on them. And God began to do miracles. Acts chapter 8, the Holy Ghost is poured out again. And, uh, and Philip has great revival there. The apostles come down and pray for them. And they receive the Holy Ghost. Acts 10, Cornelius' household is filled with the Holy Ghost. How do they know it? He's a Gentile. They heard him speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. That was the initial evidence. But then there was the power of the Holy Ghost, the anointing that stayed with them. Acts chapter 19, and the disciples of John the Baptist, they needed the Holy Ghost. Amen. And when they received it, they spoke in other tongues. It was the initial sign, but it was not the, the abiding peace and the fruit of the Spirit, love, gentleness, meekness, joy, temperance. Those are the fruits that the Holy Ghost will bear in our lives as we live for and acknowledge Jesus Christ in the Holy Ghost. If we're not bearing that fruit, then we need to get closer to that anointing. We need to get closer to the Lord and allow him to work through us and allow him to do what he wants through us because he's going to use you and he's going to use me to be a light and a witness to this world. And somebody ought to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Because we don't have to be bound by sin addictions, drugs, all the, all the craziness that's out of that world, and we are free. He that the Son has set free is what? Free indeed. I can serve the Lord. I can worship the Lord. There's no limit to how much I can love. There's no limit to how kind I can be, how gentle, how meek, how temperate. No limits on those things. I can just, the, the, the sky's the limits. Amen. Because I'm a child of God. I'm not living after the world. I'm living after the Lord. As we stand to our feet this evening, we want to lift our hands and just ask God to direct our hearts and open us up to his will in our lives. Each one of us is in a different point in our journey. God is working in us. He's revealed to us tonight that there is power available for us to overcome and to gain victory, whether it's over sin, over the devil, whether it's over the flesh, Amen. Whether it's over all the lies that we've been told, 
God wants to set us free. Father, we pray for your delivering power and your anointing, God, to break the yokes of sin, to break the yokes of doubt, God, to set us free from past preconceived notions that have been put in our minds so that we can see this truth in the Word of God, so that we can experience the joy that you have and be vessels that bring healing, bring hope, bring joy to the world around us. That's what you came for, and that's what you have empowered the church to do through the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And Lord, we rejoice in you and give you thanks for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody said amen.